Welcome, everybody. Right, got that. Okay, welcome, everybody, to today's um, digital special interest group. Um, so today we're going to hear from both Geraint Thomas and Morton Matheson, who've been working in the mainly social care area for around the last 10 years. And they're going to talk about their experiences and the things that they've done and the solutions that they've, 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 they've inputted into that environment. And hopefully that will be of relevance and of interest to everyone on the call. Um, we'll also after that, so that will take about 20 minutes, then I, we have another round table coming up with Orca and some people from within the NHS all about workforce. So I would love to get your input on that from people who are working within the NHS about what you think the top three issues are, or what are the top three things that need to get fixed around the, the workforce. And um, so we'll have a little discussion on that. And then uh, hopefully John will be able to give us an update on the timetable that he's been putting together for our Digital Six. We're looking at a rolling program of about three months and John and Jade and some other people have done some fabulous work in terms of getting speakers lined up for us. Uh, and uh, so it'd be great to get an update from John and then Mary, um, wants to speak about a click which I have never heard of before, to do with how primary care health has been, the informatics has been affected by COVID. So we'll come on to that at the end. So I will let Morton and Geraint introduce themselves and go through the presentation. And then I'll let you guys manage the next 20 minutes in terms of whether you want questions, you want to be interrupted or you want to leave questions to the end. Um, but over to you and very many thanks for being with us today. Thank you. Great, if I start, is that go okay with you? Yeah, okay. go for it. Real quickly, as I won't be saying too much during the presentation. My name is Morten Matheson. I'm Scandinavian. I'm Danish as of background. Uh, Co-started Sequoia 10 years ago. We do digital care planning within the social care sector of all of Scandinavia and throughout the UK. Um, I know some of you on the call already today. And uh, you know how it is when you sometimes think that I know everything there is to know about digital in a sector. And I may not feel entirely like that, but I felt somewhat like that until I met Geraint. <laughs> and uh, hence when we got the invitation to join you all today, I thought I want Geraint to, to be part of this, to help uh, cast a light on how uh, digitizing of social care is going. And um, that's why we're two here today. I'm only here to make sure that Geraint behaves. <laughs> Thanks, Mon. No, I, I promise I'm lovely. Um, I will behave. I'm very good. So, yeah. Hi, everyone. It's lovely to meet you all. Um, so, yes, I'm Garrett Thomas. Um, I run a company called Guided Innovation. We try and uh, help inspire care organisations to solve their problems with cool tech. So I am a geek. Don't judge me. Um, I love technology, uh, particularly the ones that aren't quite invented yet. They're my favourite. Um, but my head is very much in health and social care in the UK. Uh, could have chosen any other sector and earned more money, but no, I decided on health and social care. Um, so yeah, uh, what I'm going to do is share my uh, screen and take you to the presentation. If anyone's got queries, perhaps you know, drop into the chat um, and, and I'll make sure we have five minutes at the end uh, for any uh, particular questions. I do have a little video in my presentation and hopefully if I've set it up correctly, uh, it, will, it will play and you'll have the audio and everything. Okay, someone hollow when you can see my screen. Yeah, love the thumbs up. Wonderful. Yep. There, there we are. So, um, so this is me. Um, I'm born and bred in South Wales. Um, I'm from Swansea originally, and Swansea is home to one of the largest Amazon warehouses in the UK. Every 20 something year old in Swansea has worked in Amazon. Not necessarily enjoyed it, but they have worked there. Um, it was the DVLA, but, but now it's all online, so it's Amazon. Um, and uh, my OCD absolutely loves warehouses. Uh, the way things work inside a warehouse, everything has its place. And without anything moving, there's process everywhere. Every marked square on the ground has a reason that it's marked as such. And the parcel position in the room depends on where it's going and who's going to pick it up. The positioning on the shelf is all relevant. 
And it's only the individuals that are skilled and trained in that warehouse can see these patterns um, and understand what needs to be done where um, with very little communication. Um, and it's, it's really quite exciting. Now, lots, as I said, kids in Swansea have definitely been <laughs> spending their lives uh, putting boxes on shelves and taking boxes back off shelves. But if any of you have uh, ever had your shopping delivered from Ocado, you might have seen their little vans on the, on the roads and everything. Let me introduce you to the um, Ocado warehouse. So if you've ever had anything delivered by Ocado, it's, it's been picked by robots. So if anyone's going to be working in a warehouse in the future, they're going to be building and maintaining robots rather than stocking shelves. The blue ones you see whizzing around are the chilled ones, the little frozen foods. What's very cool is that each um, robot is talking to each robot around it, working out what route it can take without crashing. What you can't really tell from the video is in the warehouse, this is all up in the air. And underneath this is the humans. Humans still do quality checking. So once the robots have picked the food, it goes along conveyor belts, and humans still do the checks. Up until recently, I was able to say there has not been a single collision. <laughs> Sadly, there was a collision around Christmas time because a human got on the rails. Well done, humans. Um, but the collision did start a fire in the whole warehouse and to get shut down. It's <laughs> huge amounts. So, you know, continuing on, if I take this level of transformation in the world of social care, um, we're hoping that we can see a digital transformation throughout the sector. Um, where is it at the moment? It's kind of uh, glasses. So. <laughs> You know, I did, I won't, I won't name the company, but I did see a social care organization's website advertise that they embraced assistive technology for their residents. And they actually listed a pair of glasses uh, as one of the technologies, which they're technically not wrong. Um, it's, it's just kind of not the level that, that I'm, I'm seeing. Now, let me take you through three areas of an organization that I kind of see digital um, transforming. The three areas as I see them, are the back office systems, the operational systems, and assistive technologies. So back office systems, these are used by people in front of laptops, in front of PCs. They're very admin heavy. There's usually one person who knows how to use the finance system really well <laughs> um, and doesn't share with anyone else. Uh, they run your business for you. Uh, you can't live without them. If they were to go down, you'd be in trouble. So these are your HR systems and things like that. Um, we're seeing more digitalization happening now at the coal face, so in the operations. So this is out in supported living environments, domiciliary care, care homes, nursing homes, um, learning disabilities, autism, all these kind of places. Um, they're more focused on user experience. They're going to be more likely to be accessed on a handheld device. Uh, so tablets and, and, and phones like this one would be used. Um, Usability is really important. And these solutions are mainly focused on quality and risk reduction. Uh, they're not really there to save you time and money, um, although often a byproduct is that they do that. But primarily, they're about delivering a better service to your patient or resident. And regulators are becoming more au fait with these systems. Uh, and, I, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see them, them really start honing in on them. Um, and then you've got these assistive technologies, which not a lot of organizations are doing. Um, I'm finding where they are doing it, it's in pockets. I'm actually seeing most assistive technologies in a, a care organization are being brought in by the resident 
when they're in, when they're being onboarded. I mean, it's amazing, but yeah, you know, you've got these these elderly people walking into a care home, perhaps laden with their Alexas and their Kindles um, and, and any other kind of tech that they're using. Um, but what, what I'm not seeing is that they walk into a room empty handed and in the room are Alexas uh, and other technologies that could assist them. Uh, these are very simple. They're, they're very plug and play. Uh, they're not necessarily expensive. I genuinely see them as a game changer uh, for the way reablement services and, and care organisations would, would engage uh, their services to people. If I take each of one of these. I spend a little bit of time on it. So the, the back office systems, here's a, here's a splattering of the kind of systems that you're going to see in back office. Um, there's the fundamentals like your, your, your HR, payroll, finance, stuff like that. But we're also seeing more document management, SharePoint, for example, organizations are using. Um, learning management systems, LMSs, so that's your e-learning and tracking compliance in terms of, of that. Um, pipeline and onboarding at the bottom there. So that's your CRMs, um, which I see Microsoft Dynamics is a very popular one or Salesforce or a really good spreadsheet. <laughs> um, I don't really count Excel and Word as digital. Now, if I could have jumbled these up a little bit, um, actually more, did I just see your hand go up? No, I just wanted to ask you, well, how many of social care providers do you think have those backbone systems in place? I'll, I'll be I'll be confident to say all of them. Okay. I will be confident to say all of them. Um, as a, as a sector, if you can save money on your back office functions, you will. You want to spend your money at the coalface. You don't want to be spending it on a head office or an office. So it's often the first area that's digitalized. Right. Um, good HR system should save. Ask, I'm going to ask the same question on your next slide. So remember okay. that. All right. <laughs> So um, if I jumble these up on my next slide, they kind of move like this. So care organizations will probably have the ones on the left. These are kind of the backbone of running your business. Uh, there'll be a, a fingerprint entry or a pin code entry to get in the doors or someone has to press a button to let you in. Um, that's CRM to track uh, the journey that people go on to come into your organization. Um, Hopefully your documents are stored in some sort of SharePoint uh, environment, but perhaps areas that aren't quite there. Although I'll be honest, I've seen um, COVID has kind of reprioritized people in terms of digital. And I've definitely seen intranets pop up very quickly if they didn't exist beforehand. And things like collaboration tools like uh, Teams, Microsoft Teams uh, might now be in organizations. Um, Pointing out accidents and incidents, a highly regulated area. Um, and I'm seeing better and better tools entering the market that can capture accidents and incidents. There's also an awful lot of bad ones. So yeah, be, be careful. Uh, believe it or not, you know, if you look at the kind of the gas and oil industry around accidents and incidents, their products work beautifully in a care home because uh, they have the same kind of regulation and risk around it. Um, so if I move on to the kind of the operational systems, um, so EMAR, electronic medication administration records, so these are digital systems that link with pharmacies and give you life prescriptions. Um, buildings maintenance, uh, again, this was done highly on Excel, but I'm starting to see a trend of people having systems to maintain uh, all your business. Again, the, this links to your accidents and incidents, your near misses, your carpets that are coming up at the edges and people can trip over um, and things like that. Um, Morton, if you can ask me the same question. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, sure, yeah. Yeah, th this is less adopted in the social care sector. Um, I think everybody has started a journey to digitalize their operations, but where they are in that journey differs greatly. Some haven't started and they're just looking at their first one. Others have digitalized most of what you're looking at here on the screen. Um, but if I take electronic rostering, for example, um, I think the saturation of the market is around the 80%. I think about 80% of care organizations use a digital system for it. Uh, digital care planning is, is closer to the 50, 60%. Um, but again, if I jumble these up, this happens. 
um, I have my, my triangle of systems. So if you've digitalized your patient records, so digital patient records, um, as they might be referred to in the, in the NHS, um, electronic rostering systems and electronic medication administration systems. If you have successfully digitalized these three, your regulator is going to be happy. <laughs> For me, I see these three to be incredibly focused on quality of service, safety of service. And I've been heavily involved in the implementation of these systems into care organizations and where I've met care companies that have digitalized all three of these, they look forward to their CQC inspection. Uh, they enjoy that experience of when a CQC inspector goes, show me who's on shift yesterday. And they just press a button and there it is. And then they pick on someone and they go, well, show me what they did yesterday. And then they go into the digital care planning system and they shows it all. Oh, you did, did meds. What meds did they deliver yesterday? And they go into the email system and show they're the exact meds. They didn't do the control drug because they're not qualified. And then they go into the LMS system. So if you can, you know, if you haven't started a digital journey on your operational, on your operations, this is the area that I'd suggest people start in these three. Once you've ticked these off, you're a safe organization in the eyes of, of your regulators. Now, I again the CQC to pick on them. Um, you know, their five-year plan promises to start wanting us to self-report. So you need these systems in place to be able to send, you know, I don't, I don't believe we're far off CQC wanting to know on a quarterly basis how many controlled drugs you've delivered, for example. Um, so if you digitalize these systems, you'll be ahead of the curve ready when CQC asks for this, which I've got no doubt they will. I mean, Morton, just to pick on you, you know, your, your, your company delivers digital care planning solutions. Are you seeing regulators engaging with your systems? Oh, for sure. I think also with the latest uh, sort of breakdown of how CQC wants to take its own organization forward when it comes to being digital, I'm expecting uh, the regulators want to uh, get access to records from afar, not necessarily having to visit on site a place for finding out how people are being treated. So yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a really positive response to both our system and other systems out there. That's good. And then the assistive technologies. So again, like I said, I'm not seeing a lot of these in use. Uh, where they are, they're siloed and, and, and in splatterings. Um, Alexas are probably the most used. Uh, a few care organizations are building some of their rooms to have automation in it where you can turn the lights on and off. Fantastic for verbal uh, residents that perhaps aren't as physically able to move around and get around. Big button devices, yeah, put that on there. I hate putting that on there. A telephone with really big buttons doesn't really... <laughs> count uh, is the mundane side of these things but you know I'm, I'm seeing some fantastic things virtual reality is being used in autism services particularly children's services with autism uh, depressurizes people very well um, if you can put them into an environment they're comfortable in um, augmented reality um, the microsoft hololens is coming down in price i've seen this used uh, with an individual with brain injury who who had very little uh, memory his dream was to be able to walk to the corner store and buy his newspaper. He always had to be accompanied by a support worker to do that because he would get lost, even though it wasn't far away. Um, I've seen him use a HoloLens and it literally, you, you say out loud where you're going. It uses Bing Maps to work out where that is. And just like on a map, it paints a red line on the pavement in front of you. And all he has to do is follow the red line. And it takes him from where he where he he's resident to to the newspaper store and back again, and it's the first time he's ever been able to go on his own to get a newspaper, which is phenomenal. And now now he first thing he asked afterwards is, can I use it to go and see my sister? And suddenly it just opened the world up for him. Um, that's just one example. You know, I've seen sensor technology save people's lives, um, wearables that alert staff uh, quicker to things, and. Um, apps uh, that help people who are blind. So there's there's an awful lot of availability here. It's cutting edge still, I will say that. 
it's only going to come down in price. It's only going to get more accessible. Um, if you haven't got an assistive technology strategy right now, that's OK. I'll let you off. <laughs> but you certainly want to be having one uh, going into the end of this year and into next year. I, I think that, that's when you really want to be uh, spending some time on this. Um, conscious of time. I'm going to now move a little bit into procurement just to, just to think on this. I've got to talk about this weighing up of best of breed solutions versus big enterprise solutions. I'm not a believer anymore in the enterprise solutions, your oracles, your saps, your big products that do as much as possible. Um, it was that these were cheaper and it was that the modules of their products. Oh, we do HR and we do payroll and we do finance and we do onboarding and we do recruitment and we do and we do. Um, they're not necessarily cheaper anymore and they don't necessarily talk to each other their modules you know i can point to suppliers that say things talk systems talk to each other and they don't um, i'm far more of a very believer in best of breed and the only reason i switched was because of a lovely word that if you do pronounce it you'll say all day long um, interoperability uh, it was a bit of a buzzword uh, said a lot last year and a little bit the year before um, but now hold your suppliers to account please buy the best intranet you can buy the best accident and incident solution on the market yeah. or the cheapest the one most tailored to your organization and say to that supplier oi before i sign <laughs> can you add into the contract please that you will talk to my other systems here's their numbers ring them um, put that pressure on your supplier because your suppliers need to have these arrows they need to be able to link with your other systems I'm not talking about data today because that's another hour. <laughs> but let's just imagine your accident incident system alerts you that someone's made a medication error. Your medication system's telling you that they've delivered this medication over 3,000 times in their career with you. Your rostering system's telling you they've been um, planned to work, you were well staffed on the day, it's all fine. And your HR system says that that employee has worked for you for seven years. That paints you a picture of that med error. If your system say this is the first time they've ever given that drug, they were rostered today, but actually you're short staffed and half of your staff were agency and your HR system says they're still in probation. <laughs> that's a different picture and you should be more worried about the issue. So having these systems, best of breed, all talking to each other, should give you that level of insight around your data. Um, moving on a little bit, because I'm, I'm, I'm touching everything slightly, but just don't have the time to go into detail. I have to mention implementation. Don't give your rollout to Carol. Everybody has a Carol. Carol is the person in your individual, in, in the individual in your organization who's competent, really good, get stuff done. And by the nature that she gets stuff done and, and is competent, she's also one of your busiest people. <laughs> and everyone leans on Carol. So don't say, Carol, get on with it. Can you do this, please? Um, you've got three options. If you've got to use Carol, free her up, give her time, take stuff off her so she can roll things out. Ideally, you'd find someone with time in your organization because it needs time to roll these systems out or outsource, find a partner, find a company that can come in temporarily, work with you um, and do all the change management and project management, all the good stuff to get your business ready for the, for the change. Um, I've got four takeaways for you. If anything I've said is interesting to you, four places I suggest you start. I'm being quick on purpose. We have a staffing crisis. I know what you're talking about. Thanks, June, for sharing that with us um, after this presentation. Um, where, where does health organizations need to deal with their workforce try and get workforce to start with <laughs> good luck it's, it's really really challenging please look at your onboarding experience for staff if you don't have a rostering and onboarding solution get one there's wonderful onboarding apps that allow staff to engage with their e-learning before they start engage with the team have joining instructions blah 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 um, salary drawdown solutions this links to your rostering and your payroll and it looks at what people have worked and it allows them through an app to take their salary before payday. It's dangerous. Don't expose all the people's salaries to it. But as a minimum, allow people to cash in their overtime the day they did it. You will see a massive uptake in the number of 
permanent staff you have that pick up additional shifts, reducing your reliance on agency, and staff love it. That operations triangle, if you haven't done any of them, please start a program of work. I said you can wait for your assistive technology. But for this, if you're not doing one, do it. I suggest you start with electronic rostering. It's, it's got one of some of the biggest return on investments for you. Um, and in the current climate with staffing, it really will help you. If you've done one or two of them, brilliant, well done, fantastic, you're amazing. But keep going, try and get all three. You might not think you want email, but, but try it, look at, the, look at the benefits. And if you've done all of them, please don't think you're done. These products are getting better and better and better. Whenever your renewal is, do a procurement exercise. Always look at the market before every renewal. And Teams. Teams is a little bit of a game changer. Everywhere I've turned it on, email has reduced, reliance on email. Collaborations increased. People share documents. People problem solve themselves. People reach out going, hi, I'm stuck. I've got this resident X, Y, Z. And someone answers. I've only said, your worst case scenarios won't happen. Don't think for a minute that when you turn it on, everyone's going to swear and start sharing patient data. <laughs> You know, it self-polices. People in our sector know not to talk about service use inappropriately, et cetera. So um, I promise you, your worst case in your head, it will not happen. <sighs> I know that's been fast. I know it's a whistle-stop tour. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Um, hopefully something there has piqued your interest. Um, and I am here. I've got lots of insight. I've got, uh, you know, the 10 commandments of turning on teams. I've got lots of stuff that could help uh, if people want me to uh, to reach out and I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much Geraint and Morton. That was that was really interesting and actually quite thought-provoking as well. I've got a number of yeah. comments of my own but um, uh, there's a couple of questions that have come up also on the chat but is there, uh, well we'll go to the first one from Richard and could I ask other people for their, for their comments and what they thought? I'll, I'll leave mine for the moment. Okay, uh, Richard is asking, um, what do you think the biggest barrier to adoption uh, and the use of tech sites? I mean, residents bring their own technology, assistive technology into care homes or residencies. So I'm actually finding that staff, so residents, staff, leadership. I'm finding leaders aren't necessarily bought in to the fact that assistive technology is a game changer. I think they think it's very nice to have. And generally the population tends to use assistive technology like that. You know, we all, we've got Alexa, it's got you know, the answer to everything and all we do is play Spotify through it. Um, staff are really good. It's the staff that often go, oh, this resident would really benefit from Alexa. I've got it at home. You could use it for reminders. He loves cooking. It could show him recipes. I find staff are actually really good adopters of this. Um, residents, you need to work with the family members uh, to help that. Mainly, it's two things. It's cost. Who's going to pay for it? This will help your dad. Are you going to buy it? Or am I buying it? Or is the commissioner buying it? Hi, local authority. Can you pay for an Alexa? <laughs> good luck. I think some are, some are considering it. Um, so it's the, it's the cost. And the second one is whose internet is it using? How horrible it is to talk like this, but not all care organizations give uh, availability through the internet to their residents. Oh, we put them on the network. Hang on, we've now got residents on the network. What risk does that run? So actually it's your IT guy <laughs> uh, worrying about that. And then it's, it's who's gonna fund it. But it's just a technology. It, it, there's less of a barrier to that than there is to the operational systems. There's yes. more of a barrier there. Yeah. I'll, I'll just make a comment then. I mean, my background is I, I worked for IBM for 35 years and in the 90s, we nearly went out of business. We were two weeks away from going out of business and we did exactly what you used to say. You know, the first thing you focus on is your back office systems. And, you know, and globally, we kind of like consolidated, took out lots of costs and moved it forward until you eventually, um, you, you know, digitize your customer facing systems. I would say healthcare, maybe the other way around. In my experience, the focus has really been on the customer facing systems and not on the back office systems. Now that might have changed because I left, you know, th three years ago, but whenever we, you know, the big national program was all about customer facing systems 
you know, and putting in electronic patient records that gather patient data, but they didn't have the fundamental back office systems in there in terms of HR, finance, procurement, things weren't integrated. Would anybody like to comment on that? I, I could have got that completely wrong, but are, are, is, are things different now? You're not asking me, are you? Are you asking the audience? Like, from <laughs> our experience, I think you're spot on. I, 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 literally everything is patient focused, patient focused, patient focused, nothing to do with staff, nothing to do with back office systems. And if they do have back office systems, they sure as hell don't integrate into the wider picture. Either. Yeah, yeah. I, I would tell, I mean, because e things fairly new. I mean, you know, in, t in, in terms of, and, that, and that's the kind of things that you do need in place. Uh, Jason's got his hand up. Jason, would you like to make a comment? Yeah, I, I, I think I'd say the picture is a bit more mixed than that. I think there are some core finance systems, there are some core HR systems, some of which are <clears throat> national or semi-national. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, I wouldn't, so the, the, there is some progress there. E-rostering has come in. Uh, there's been some challenges with that. Uh, and I think there is a challenge with linking up all of these systems uh, across from the back office to the front office as well. Because if you're e-rostering, you want to be scheduling staff their availability against the schedules you've got for the the patient. So I think that's the the next generation for us. Um, I, I wouldn't quite say we've got customer focused systems. We've got patient focused, uh, patient -focused for the staff, um, and there is a lot more we need to be doing on patient focused systems for the patients and the carers and the support network. So um, there's a lot of work going on at that at the moment, but that's been uh, slow and needs to speed up as well. Yeah, really, really good points. And I'm glad you made that differentiation because it's, it, it's, it's important. Uh, John. Thank you, June. I just, I'd like Geraint's uh, observations around, if you look at primary care, the opportunity for consolidation in back office systems there you know we've got seven and a half thousand surgeries they all seem to have still their own back office systems despite the advent of uh, uh, regional practice networks or if you looked even at social care and look at the you know i think there's thirty six thousand uh, care and nursing homes in in england i think that's about the right number you know I appreciate some of the larger groups have probably got consolidated systems that are looking from a back office perspective, but I wonder the extent to which that could be something that could be provided for the sector to again cut down on on uh, on cost and, and inefficiencies that must prevail because people probably have, haven't been able to afford the very latest and best uh, back office systems. Just in, interest in your observation, really. Yeah, the world of the world of social care is driven by regulation. Um, until the regulator started saying, you know, you have to have a digital record of someone's journey. Until that happened, people weren't adopting digital care plans. It was only the, the cutting edge, forward thinking ones that did. In terms of primary care, you're, you're right. You know, every doctor's surgery is using different back office systems. Even with, even with, like you said, the networks and the CTGs, it hasn't really harmonised or standardised um, across it. I've, I've not seen it, but I, I also don't see any suppliers or funders that are encouraging it. So in the social care space, the funders are our local authorities. Our local authorities are not encouraging care organisations to digitalise. Um, I'm not seeing it. They, they just want the cheapest hourly rate that can be given. Um, I'd love to see Pressing, isn't it? You know, so it, it seems like to me like such an opportunity now that the digital technology capability has advanced so in such an accelerated manner in recent years. We just we're not thinking the right way about how we embrace and adopt that. Perhaps I'd, I'd, I was I was with a women's charity in London just the other day, and they said with these sensors we could reduce the hours of care we have to deliver to this vulnerable woman, to the local authority. We will save you this much money. Can you buy these sensors, please? No, because they haven't got a box to tick for buying sensors, <laughs> but they do have a box to tick for, for paying over the odds for care. Um, you're right, it, that, that's not happening. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, a, a major barrier uh, 
to uptake. Jan, um, I see you've got your hand up. Um, yeah, hi, sorry. Uh, thank you. I'm just talking as a, a nurse um, in healthcare for the last 36 years and um, have retired in the last year, but I still work in the NHS. Um, appreciate you talking about the private sector, but my experience of implementation of tech into healthcare has been um, not, not brilliant, um, although I'm a big advocate for it. The, the problem is that the promise of interoperability is, is rarely achieved and the, the negative impact of that means that nurses and carers end up doing more work. So where you, I, I mean, administrative work, having to work a, technolo a technological solution. Um, I wondered how you safeguarded against that when you're implementing tech into your, your various um, yeah. locations. That's brilliant. And I'll, I'll bring you to two, two points on my slides that kind of work in harmony to answer what you've just said. One was that best of breed approach to buying systems. The NHS was notorious for buying a big system that did as much as possible. Um, if you buy the best little system that captures accidents and incidents and people falling over the carpet, We've seen a fantastic boom of suppliers to the market in just the last seven years. I mean, Morton, how old is Sequoia? Five in the UK. Yeah. Five in the UK. There we are. We've, I've seen a massive influx. These are nimble, agile software companies that when you say, will you integrate my systems, just laugh at you. Of course we will. They have in my words, generic APIs that are well documented. They have this tech that allows those arrows on my slide to happen. So, Going with the best product um, for your problem and getting them all to talk to each other should help your staff. No dual entry. Don't retype the patient into that system. And the other one was that implementation services. Implement correctly with party poppers and cuddles. Don't worry, staff. This is coming, but you're going to love it. Here's the three things you need to do. One, put the kettle on. <laughs> Two, make yourself a cup of tea. Three, Use the system. It's, you, it's that change management and investing in it, not putting on Carol, but investing in that implementation should help the staff. So the best product, implement it properly. And that should, but so many organizations don't, they buy the first product they see or the one their friend recommended, and then they just give it to staff and say, use it. It, yeah, I can see that you've gone through that, haven't you, Jan, a few times? Yeah, I think I'm Carol. That's my problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bitter and cynical. <laughs> but, but, but just a comment on that, you know, interoperability is hard. You know, I've been talking about it for years and there must be a management overhead in trying to, in, in to you know, get different systems to talk to each other and, and, and a cost overhead as well, you know, because... You know, working with small companies, there's also risk involved in terms of are we still going to be there, you know, three years from now, and are you the, their only client? So I, I, I agree with what you're saying in terms of best of breed. It sounds great, but I think getting different products to talk to each other isn't as easy as what you're, as what you're implying. Well, I, I think technologically it's it's easy, and that's what Garand is saying, isn't it? That most of the companies like such as Sequoia or, or other care planning companies in the sector will be born natively as an app, will be software as a service, means you yeah. can shoot out an update without even the users registering that there is an update. You don't have to download the app again or anything. So we're, we're born to do stuff like this. What hinders us, unlike in the public sector, what hinders us is, is probably more of a business model convergence. Is this a good idea for us as a business to integrate with an EMAR system so we can fulfill Garant's triangle and most often it is because we know our play against some of the bigger players in the market is we can do this yeah and what about yeah I understand what you're saying about your own your, your own product but a lot of you know NHS organizations have got legacy products in there which they will not want to rip and replace no nope. you know they'll have nope. legacy good. yeah for yeah. the transfer of data between the NHS and social care, we're looking more to a standardized way of doing this, the FHIR, FHIR, or shared care records, or yeah. something like that, that's going to be mandatory for everyone that wants to share records across the board. So if Sequoia wants to play in that as a business, we just have to converge. Some Something like that we see happening across Scandinavia, it's something called 
common language three. Everybody needs to adhere to that standard and you share data across the board. And if you don't, well, too bad for your business. <laughs> Excellent. Ruthless standardization. I love yes. it. <laughs> Stuart's got a question. Yeah, hi. Uh, first time joining, so I'm finding it very interesting, everybody. Thanks very much for your help. Um, yeah, I work for a, a technology company that we we look to sell into the NHS with workforce uh, optimization solutions. Um, I think there's a, there's a session on workforce coming up, but my, I don't know whether it was a question or, or just looking to see whether anybody um, has had any experience of, as you mentioned earlier, um, legacy systems. So what we're finding is we're, we're looking to integrate with multiple systems, but some of the barriers to entry we're finding is where these legacy systems are ingrained they are almost protective of their own areas and they don't want to interact or interrupt with other because they either want to build it themselves or they'd like to protect their own interests so just wonder if there's any thoughts on how you see that moving forward uh, with the legacy systems you're right um, I talked about the new influx of suppliers to the market in the last seven years. You know, mm. these are going to be agile. They're going to connect. They're going to be up for connecting. The legacy systems, the old ones, less so. They're going to struggle with the ar architecture to achieve it. They'd have to develop yeah. it. It'll cost them money. Like you said, they're going to want to steal your idea and build it themselves. Um, yeah, and it's, I suppose it's encouraging the organization you're selling into to ditch it, you know, to build a strategy to move off the legacy system. By, mm. by the very nature of the architecture and struggling to integrate, it's not going to look nice. It's probably not no. going to be working on a native app. It's not going to do push notifications. The, supply, the customer is going to miss out on all that functionality, uh, modern day functionality. So yeah, I would, I would fly the flag for ditching legacy systems that don't, inter don't do the arrows. Easier said than done. I, I was going to say, I'll, I'll pass that over to my sales colleagues. That sounds like <laughs> yeah. Thanks very much. <laughs> Oh, okay. Is there, is there any more questions for um, Geraint and Morton? Okay, well, Mary. Mary's got a question. Mary, are you on mute, Mary? Yes, I'm unmuted. Well done. We're talking about ditching legacy systems, but there's great, these are systems that are actually being used to provide care in the here and now. Every time you hear about a major trust changing systems, you then have a whole series of follow-up nightmares where the data got lost, patients got damaged, um, care was not provided due to the change both of the system and of the organization going around the system. How do how would ditching a, a legacy system like that really improve patient care in the short term? You, you, you're spot on, Mary. You really are, and I, I am the eternal optimist. Therefore, I can stand here and say, "Ditch it." Um, <laughs> you're right. In real terms, it's like that. However, it's all. I will suggest it's not okay to be held ransom by an old system that does what it does very competently and nothing else. I suppose the challenge would be to work with your partner, work with that organization that supplies the system, ask them to open up their development roadmap, show you what they're developing, how they're growing their product, how they're keeping up to date with trends. While at the same time, you know, doing a spotlight outside to see what other things are on the market and just be, be educated in what the art of the possible is. And that there'll be a tipping point. There'll be a tipping point where actually the patient experience, the, the triaging, the speed to treatment, et cetera, is, will be enhanced by the new products. There'll be that tipping point or your supplier comes up to scratch and they do a version 2.0 and it's all brilliant. Um, but you're right, you'll have those horror stories. Um, the smaller the organization, the easier it is to do that. The larger, the harder, I do get that. And it's a hugely time consuming and hugely costly sometimes. I do, I do get it, Mary. It's not easy. Yeah, no, it's, it's especially not in our health and social care sector. But and Mary, um, thank you for that. Uh, I'm sure you'd love to ask some more, but I'm going to need to cut it because we're now uh, 
just after quarter two and we've just got a number of other things to discuss. But I'd like to thank Gary and Morton for the presentation. That was really insightful and, as I said, thought-provoking. And Jade can um, publish your contact details. And if anybody on the call wants to follow up anything with you or ask you any further questions, I suggest they do it that way by emailing you. Yeah, fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. That's great. Take care. Great. Okay. All right. So I'd just like to um, advertise a couple of events that's coming up. But you, you know, this, this is very um, uh, timely, actually, because we've got a Dragon's Den event happening soon, uh, uh, where we've got a number of startups who are going to present to us for, I think it's five minutes each, six minutes each, and then you will be the judges in terms of, you know, which one of these has got the most potential, uh, you know, within the health and social care sector. I don't know if Jade's on the call, or John, would you like to say a few words about that, about where we've got our Jade? What data is it? Is I, I, can see, I can see that Jade is furiously typing away at this very moment, presumably oh, right, okay. she's gonna post the details in the chat function, but this is great fun. It's an hour, it's it's super quick. It's designed to uh, highlight some new technologies that are that are keen to expand within uh, health and social care. And the, the purpose of the event is to give them a helping hand, give them a bit of a signposting, uh, give them some direct advice. And then at the end, of course, because it's a Dragon's Den event, the, uh, the, the imaginary huge piles of cash that each of the dragons would have they can nominate whether any of them should get them, and if so, why? So uh, do do tune in. It's going to be great fun. It's on. Hang on. Ninth of March. Thank you, Jade. <laughs> Thank you. Ninth of March. Twelve till half one. It's going to be great fun. Anyway, if you'd like to join in, anybody on this team would uh, on this special interest group would find it a lot of fun. I think. So do uh, do feel free to sign up. Excellent. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, John and Jade. And then just stay on the line because we've got another um, round table coming up, which will be chaired by Roy, Roy Lilly, um, in conjunction with Orca, and it's focused on workforce. Now, I don't know who the attendees are from the NHS yet. You might have an update on that. But the discussion, it'll be an hour's discussion again, and it'll be around workforce. So it'd be great to get your input people on the call who work in the health and social care sector to just give us some insight on, you know, if you were in charge of workforce of the NHS, what are the top three things that you'd want fixed? Is it things like morale? Is it, you know, access to technology? I don't think so. Is it um, more staff? But um, anyway, Jade, if you could, or John, if you could just tell us when that is and if and who we're going to be having the round table with within the, yeah, it's the, it's the June, it's the 23rd of March. Thank uh, you. Jade has just put the link up. I'm not sure the event is live yet. Um, I think okay. we are about to make it live. We're hoping that Jacqueline Davis, who's the uh, deputy uh, people person at NHS England and is CEO of the Leadership Academy, uh, NHS Leadership Academy will, will be one of the guests. I'm expecting that to be confirmed today. Um, and there will be at least a couple of other people, including, you'll be pleased to learn, somebody from the social care sector as well, who will be providing some insights there. Uh, I think the person we, we're hoping is going to come along is one of the architects and authors with Adam of our recent social care people plan. Um, so I think that will be a fabulous event. As I say, 20, uh, 20 3rd of March, uh, and we'll be making the event live very shortly. Okay. Thank you, John. That's great. And, I, and I'm assuming it will be a focus across, you know, with primary care, secondary care, social care. Everything goes. We are right. an integrated okay. institute, and there's no reason why we should home in on one aspect. No, absolutely not. Okay. So has anyone got any kind of like burning items that they'd like us to raise? especially given that if we get Jacqueline, you know, she's running the Leadership Academy as well, because I know, you know, that that topic is hot on people's minds from just previous discussions on this call. Um, we're working at that at the moment, June, but if people have got specific requests, I can see Mary's asking about HEE. Um, well, let's wait and see. We're, we're, we've got our invites out at the moment to people. Right. OK. OK, good. All right. Um, Shall I draw uh, your attention to the next digital tech SIGs? 
yes uh, and speakers therein so mm -hmm. on the, the next one of these events digital technology special interest group is the 8th of april where we have the fabulous jan jan christian is going to be speaking to us you saw jan earlier and she's on the call right now jan we're very grateful to you jan is director of clinical services and a clinical safety officer and she's going to be talking about clinical safety challenge of technology in health um, I think that's going to be fascinating. 27th of May, then, we've got Ian Clegg, and Ian is founder of the Care Connector Network, and he's going to be talking about the differential between single supplier versus multiple supplier and the opportunities uh, and challenges that that creates. And then on the 24th of June, who could miss this? Richard White Haynes, our own Richard, who's also on the call today, is going to be talking about caring for patients closer to home. We're really looking forward to that. If I could just draw uh, members' attention to next week, 9th of March, it is an early start, 8 a.m. Uh, on Wednesday the 9th, we've got Dr. Jason Scott talking about critical incident reporting. And the reason I think that's interesting for this group is there's bound to be a digital technology uh, 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 perspective to that and I do think the, the means by which we report critical incidents and perhaps more importantly the learning that we get from them is something that I think would be really useful for members from this group uh, to perhaps home in on. Um, so I think that's if you'd like me to I will happily put the link up for that as well uh, if that would be useful. It's just be you to it and just put the link in oh, uh, the chat. Um, I'm going to do my own shameless plug now because on the 8th of March, which is Tuesday next week, we have our roundtable discussion about the people plan for social care, which we have launched. Um, we are launching it officially at the House of Lords on the 28th of March. Uh, but on the 8th, we've got Martin Green from uh, Care England and Nadra Ahmed from the National Care Association along with the authors of the People Plan and myself, discussing um, the plan in its entirety, why there's a need for a plan, but digital health and digital adoption is a common theme throughout the plan on ensuring that integration of, of health and social care moving forward and the benefits for workforce moving forwards are, are taken into account. So if anyone wants to attend that with any questions or wants to uh, email me any questions over beforehand, more than happy to, and I can put them to Martin, Nadra and the authors as well. There you go. Don't let anybody say that the Institute is not trying to create content for its members. I think Jay, I was talking to Jade earlier on today between last February and this February. Jade, you, you can come in with the number. How many events did we broadcast for members? 223. <laughs> 223 different events. There you go. And doesn't she look great on it, Jade? Doesn't she look great, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. It's amazing. And I, I mean, I, I just want to commend both of you to put, for putting forward the programme for the digital health SIG for the next three months. It must That's... be said that Jade and Michaela have done all the work on that. They've done a sensational job. Thank you to them. No, thank you very, very much. That, that's super. That's great. Right. And I mustn't forget um, Mary and the click SIG. Mary, do you want to just describe what... Um, <laughs> this event's about? Right. The Primary Healthcare Specialist Group runs Click Six, which are sort of mini workshops lasting for a day on various topics of interest to primary healthcare informatics. There's one coming up on the 12th of March, which is being held in New York. There is some um, it's, it's on the impact of COVID on primary health care informatics, which has been considerable. The program is on the link that Dave's just posted, and I posted at the beginning of the meeting. Um, it's technically these Fixings are confined to members of the primary health care specialist group, but I think everybody would be welcome. Yeah, that sounds really interesting, actually, you know, and, and very, very, very topical, you know, given where we are. 
Okay. The idea of a tip stick is that after uh, afterwards a report is produced. Okay. It runs under Chatham House rules, so it's not recorded. Um, and everybody is free to say just what they want. There's also a jam board that's open now for anyone to put comments, questions. That's in the link. Yeah, that's great. I must try and join that. Given that um, I've been working with your informatic systems when I've been volunteering at the local vaccination centres. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, guys, we're just coming up to the top of there. We've got two minutes left, but um, thank you for all your contributions today and all your comments. Is any more for any more before we sign out? And I wish you all a fantastic weekend. And I hope to see you at some of the events on the 8th, 9th, 12th. I mean, you know, we could take up everyone's time, but please, your, your support is very valued. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, and do have a fantastic weekend. Thank you. Bye. Great Bye, job, everybody. Jim. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Bye. Have a good weekend. Cheers. Thanks, Jim. Super job, as ever. Much obliged.